We are one week away from Rosh Hashanah, the new biblical year, very significant time. And it's significant biblically for a number of reasons that we'll, we'll be mentioning over the next few weeks. Number one, Adam was created on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, the new year. Not only was Adam created on that day, according to the biblical calendar, but you know, Sarah, the mother of faith, was not able to conceive. And according to Jewish understanding, it was on Rosh Hashanah that she went, her barrenness was removed and she conceived Isaac. It was also the day on which the matriarch Rachel, who also struggled to have children, she conceived Joseph on Rosh Hashanah, on the biblical New Year, on the Feast of Trumpets. It's also the day on which Hannah, Hannah, who was barren, who cried out to God, God heard her prayers and she conceived, and nine months later had the Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet. And there's a reason why on this day, on Rosh Hashanah day, that starts next Sunday night, why all those women conceived and were able to ultimately bear a child is because this day is a day, the new year is a day of life. It's a day in which God wants to bring forth life. He wants to bring forth blessing. But in order to be able to conceive the promise, you can't conceive unless you believe. The two go hand in hand. And so on the Jewish New Year, the passages that we traditionally read are Genesis 21 and 22, the st uh, stories of Isaac, the story of Abraham and Sarah. And part of the reason why we read it at this season is because this is a season to develop faith, it's a season to develop hope, and it's a season to develop trust. And it's for this reason that we read these passages because, listen, Sarah was 90 years old. If there's anyone who shouldn't be able to conceive, talk about having some faith to believe. Really, God, I'm 90 years old, and now you want me to have a child? I'm 40-something, and I can barely keep up with my kids. Can you imagine 90 years old with diapers? Come on. They weren't even disposable back then. 90 years old. Why? Because he was wanted... It wasn't just for Sarah's sake. She is the mother of all people of faith. And the thing that we need to know about faith that we learn from her and we remember at this season is nothing is impossible for God. God is not the God of the possible. He is the God of the impossible. You don't need faith for things that are possible. You need faith for things that are impossible like having a baby at 90 years old. That's why she named her son Yitzhak, laughter. Because you've got to imagine, you're going to laugh. God, you've got a pretty good sense of humor. And the reality is, is that even with situa situations seem bleak and improbable, and salvation seems likely, we never give up hope. Because as long as we can believe, we conceive. Even when it's dark and it's, everything seems hopeless, there's always hope. And the good news is God's law is more powerful than the law of averages. God defies the law of averages. God defines the law of logic, right? In the kingdom, one plus one equals 11. Because that's what God does. And it's an awareness for us to have daily in our lives, especially at the beginning of the year, to never despair, to never lose hope, but to have faith and to believe. Because as we head into the new year, it's like it's a new opportunity to birth what God wants us to bring forth at this season. And so many of you have been kind of pregnant with a promise for a long time, and you're like, man, it's time to have this baby already. Guys, I've been pregnant for about 20 years. That's what you see right here. No. 20 years of waiting to birth something. And I can tell you for the first time, like in those 20 years, I am beginning to see it birth. We are beginning to see it birth as a community. And we got to have that faith. The emunah. Can you say emunah? we got to have that faith. Because you can survive 
without faith, but you can't. You, you can survive, but you can't thrive without it. Hebrews 11:6. Now faith, now without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who comes to God must believe he exists is in the rewarder of those who seek him. Can't please God unless we have faith. So I'll never forget, right? Probably the most memorable test I ever took was I was probably in like fifth grade going into middle school. And the teacher gave us this really, this test with all these questions and she's, you know, your number two pencils. And she said, make sure you read all of the questions first before you fill them out. But, but I was so eager. We got such a few minutes of time. It's ticking. We've got 10 minutes to do all these questions. I jump in and do it. And then she goes, that's it. It's over. I'm like a quarter of the way I'm done. I'm like, this is impossible. No one can humanly do this. And the kids were all complaining. And she's like, who read the last question? Which was only answer the first question. <laughs> was the whole test. To just see if we could follow the instructions. To pass the test, you just had to follow the instructions to read all the questions. And so many of us were in such a rush in life that we failed the test. We don't do well on the test because we lack the faith to get there. And so we read about this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham... And he responded, he named me, here I am. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Yitzchak, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. Now, exactly the message that God gives to Abraham. Could you imagine God comes to you and he says, listen, I want you to sacrifice the person you love the most in your life? I mean, I remember when we had to put our dog Sammy down. It was a very traumatic day in our family. I can't even imagine, holding him there on that table, I can't even imagine if God said, hey, my son was on that table. And God says to him, Abraham, I want you to offer your son, which must have been shocking because it flies in the face of everything that Abraham knew about God until that time. Right, Ab like, you know, God constantly talks about the testing Molech, the, the sacrificing of the children of the Canaanite gods, and he calls them out of that kind of background. But here God is, and he says, Abraham, take your son, the one whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice. But the first thing we need to know is that, although Abraham didn't know it, we know it as the readers that it was only a test. God never wanted him to actually sacrifice his word his son, and the word in Hebrew for test is a nase. Can you say nase? Or nisa. And according to the, and, and literally the word for test there, nisayon, it comes from the Hebrew word for banner. Why? Because a test is meant to be like a banner. When we pass, it's meant to elevate us. The testing is never meant to break us. The testing is always meant to make us and the idea of testing is that it's meant to cause us to be lifted up. When we go through the tests in life, the tests are always for the purpose of promotion. The tests are always for the purpose of elevation and of going to the next level. So the tests are never to like hurt us, they're never to harm us. They're always because it's always for our good. And every problem has a promise attached to it and that problem is connected to a provision that God wants to provide for us. God wanted to provide something for Abraham, but first he had to face some problems and some situations and circumstances so that he would have a faith that could apprehend and comprehend what it is that God was going to do. And if God was going to build the foundation of his people upon Abraham and Sarah, and faith is the foundation of everything, as it says, the righteous will live by faith, Abraham had to have a rock solid faith upon which the covenantal promises were going to be built. And so, so, I mean, how differently would we face our trials if we really live from the perspective of that every problem, every difficulty is coming into my life for my blessing? 
So when I, had the, when I worked hours and hours and hours on these episodes this week, and all of a sudden I open up another document to grab something out of it, and all of a sudden the whole thing crashes, and I, I, had, I have it saved, I have it on autosave, and I open it back up again, and the only thing that's not saved, the only thing that was saved but is not there is everything I worked on. Let me tell you, I, had to, I wanted to say a few choice words. <laughs> but I pray, but I, but I was like, God, I was like, that, that, that in the spit of your stomach, I worked so hard, I don't have the strength to do it over again. But you know what, I had a choice. You know, I decided, you know what, obviously God, you are testing me here, and you know, I'm gonna trust you. And actually it came out better than I think it would have come out otherwise. And Abraham went through nine, ten tests. Well, actually, he went through nine trials in one test. The last one is a test. The other nine were trials because God never expected him to actually go through with it. So it wasn't a trial. It's a difference between a trial and a test. A trial is something you actually have to go through and experience the hardships of and loss in. Tests are a little bit different. And they're not meant to break us down, but to build us up. This is what it says in the book of James. Now, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have it perfect, its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And in general, we need three things to overcome testing and trials. Okay, number one, we need prayer. You don't persevere through the problems in life apart from prayer. As we shared before, right, because fear and anxiety maximizes the problems and overwhelms us. Prayer puts things into perspective. It makes God bigger than our situation and our circumstances. So we're not overwhelmed or afraid to face them. That's why David could face the giants and others couldn't, because he, he had a perspective of who God was in relationship to who his situation was. Prayer helps us put everything in perspective. It's kind of like the psalmist who said, I, 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 I wrestled with why do the wicked prosper? And he said, and then I came into the house of the Lord and I understood. The presence of God in prayer puts things into perspective. So we need prayer. Number two, we need divine wisdom and illumination to know how to handle our situations and circumstances. That's why in James he says, if you're going through trials, pray and God will give you wisdom. We need his wisdom. We don't have the wisdom oftentimes to solve our problems. So we need prayer. We need divine illumination, wisdom. And thirdly, we need an unwavering faith. Listen, the word for faith in Hebrew, emunah. Can you say emunah? It comes, from the, it comes from the word in Hebrew that means firm or certain. Right? He has a solid faith. It's literally, it's there in the Hebrew word. To have a solid a faith, a strong faith. And God uses testing and trials to perfect our faith. God tested Adam and Eve in the garden, and they what? Failed the test. God tested Abraham ten times, and he passed the test. God tested Israel ten times, and they failed the test. It says, you, they tested me these ten times in the wilderness, and they failed. God tested Yeshua, Jesus, in the garden, and he, what's the test? Passes the test in the garden in the wilderness. And how does he pass the test both when he's tested by the, by the evil one in the wilderness, by what? By the word. He quotes Deuteronomy. Man does not live by bread alone. You're to worship the Lord your God alone. So we need wisdom, and we need to count it all joys, and we need to understand our trials. Listen, I grew up in New Jersey, the mafia state. It's also the mall state. And I grew up with, like, a Tony Soprano neighbor. He's like, hey, forget about it. He's talking to me, huh? And, uh, you know, if you, guys, if you guys watch the movie Donnie Brasco, right, there's a word in there, a fagazi, right? What's a fagazi? Fagazi is a what? A fake. Like a fake diamond is a fagazi. And so you know, what, you know that one of the ways you test whether a diamond is real? You take a diamond and you put it in water, a cup of water. 
and a fake diamond loses its brilliance once it's placed in water. But a real diamond, when it's placed in waters, its brilliance is enhanced. The water are like the trials we go through. They're meant to bring out our brilliance. When we have faith, the difficulties in life make us shine. They bring out the best, and they demonstrate who we really are in that moment, in those areas God wants us to work in. And I believe God wants to give us a faith that passes the test of faith that pleases God. And so as we look at the story of Abraham this morning, there's a few keys to understanding the kind of faith that pleases God. The first thing we understand here is that God says to Abraham in Hebrew, lech lecha. Can you say lech lecha? That's a Hebrew word for therefore go. He speaks this to Abraham two primary times. The first is in Genesis chapter 12 when God tells Abraham, leave your family, leave your homeland, and go to the land that I will show you. And he speaks to him in Genesis 22 when he says, offer your son. What's the connection between the first trial and the last trial? In the first trial, what was God saying to Abraham? He says, Abraham, will you be willing to sacrifice and give up your past to me? Will you give me your past? Will you lay aside your inheritance, your wealth, everything that you've had? Will you give that all up and trust me and follow me? And at this chapter, he says, will you offer your son? The son represents what? The promise, everything that they hope for. So he says, Abraham, will you give? You've given me your past. You've shown me you're willing to give me your past. Now, for some of us, we're like, God, you can have my past. You can have, the, you can have all of it. But some of us, when it comes to our future, we're like, man, things are looking pretty good. I don't know if I want to give up my future, if I want to lay it all down. But here's the bottom line. God says to Abraham, leave your place of birth, leave your father's house, leave your past behind. It's what we spoke about a little bit a few weeks ago. It's this idea of displacement precedes replace. Displacement comes before replacement. And the bottom line is, you can't hold on to your, you can't step into the future if you're holding on to your past. If you're not willing to let go of where you've been, you can never step into where God is wanting you to go. And we shared that, like I shared with you, that, that, that story, that dream I had where I had to leave the luggage behind to enter into the new season. It's like, you know what, if you're not willing to leave the baggage of the past behind, you're never going to enter into the blessing. There are, some, there are things that you are called to leave behind. And God says to Abraham, leave everything in the past. I want to move you into the future. It's why Jesus says a man who puts his hand on the plowshare and looks back is not what? Fit for the kingdom of God. Don't look back to Egypt. And then there's the last test, Lech Lecha. And God asks him to trust him with his future. But here's the crazy thing. Faith that passes the test is willing to move forward without the details. God says to Abraham, go to the land that I'm going to show you. He doesn't say, let me tell you what that land is. Let me tell you the name of it. Let me tell you the details of it. He doesn't say anything. He just says, I want you to leave everything and go to the place that I'm going to show you. But he doesn't fill in the dots. And so Abraham has to go without the details. Now, for some of us, we're like fly by the seat of the pants type of people, and that's all okay. We're like, yeah, we'll just go with the flow. But other of us literally like the details. Like, we got to know. We got to cross our I's and no, we got to dot our I's and cross our T's. And we got to get the specifics. And too often, we don't move forward because we don't have the answers and we want to know. But true faith is about a willingness to take a leap of action. Sometimes God just causes, calls you to jump or calls you to go, and he calls you to just pick up and do something, and you don't understand why, but you have to take that leap of action. It's kind of like God says to Israel at Mount Sinai, not a save and Israel says to God at Sinai, they say, not a save and Ishma. We will do and we will understand. Because the truth of the matter, oftentimes the only way you understand is by doing. We want to understand, and then we're like, if I understand and it makes sense, I'll do it. God is like, no, in the kingdom it works the opposite way. You do it, and then you'll understand. Because that's where the faith comes in. As you walk it out, 
you understand what it is that God is doing. And oftentimes we couldn't even comprehend the bigger picture without first being able to walk it out. So faith that, that, faith that pleases God is a faith that is willing to go even when it doesn't have all the information. But number two, faith that passes the test is uh, faith that pleases God is a faith that is quick to act. And it says in this passage, and Abraham rose at what time of the day? After lunch? He rose what? Early in the morning. Friends, isn't that amazing? Abraham woke early in the morning. Some of you would be like, man, if I woke early in the morning, Jesus is coming back because I did not roll out of bed for 10 a.m. and I get here at 10.50. You know, some of you getting up early, that would be amazing in and of That would be a miracle. But that's not what I'm talking about. He rose early in the morning. You know what that implies? That Abraham actually slept. I don't know about you, but if you ever had a big presentation or a big day ahead of you, and is it easy to sleep the night before? Right? I mean, you're like struggling, like, oh my goodness, it's like, oh, everything's going through your mind. Like, I had a hard time sleeping before the taping. All these things are going through my mind. God tells Abraham, tomorrow morning, you're going to go offer your son as a sacrifice to me. And what happens? Abraham is able to sleep. That's pretty amazing. Abraham demonstrates his faith by his rest. He's able to rise early in the morning. He doesn't let the opportunity grow stale. So many times God, like God asks us to do something and what do we do? We like delay, we don't rise early, we're not quick to act, we're kind of like, there's some fear and trepidation. What happens? We let the opportunity grow cold or lukewarm. We gotta seize the opportunity. We can't let it grow cold. Can't let it grow w w lukewarm, but what, what, if you're cold, how do you get, if you're cold, it's cold outside, how do you warm up? You do what? Start moving. Warms you up. So if you want to stay warm, you got to keep moving. You got to keep in motion. But there's something even more amazing than this. Let's not miss it. The fact that Abraham rose early in the morning, it blows my mind. It's, it's this is that Abraham had a level of what's known as, here's a big word, you ready for it? Equanimity. Can you say that with me? Equanimity. Equanimity, Equanimity. that's a good word. That's a good Scrabble word, equanimity. <laughs> Equanimity. He had the ability to maintain a perfect peace and composure even in the midst of an, an, a tremendous trial. This is one of the things that distinguishes Abraham from, from, as a person of faith, knowing that he would have to sacrifice his son, but yet had equanimity. You know, we're called to praise God for the good things as well as the bad things. And not only are we required to praise God in all things, we're called to have simcha. Can you say simcha? Joy in all things. And you know what simcha, the under Hebrew word for joy, doesn't mean just joy, but literally means with a perfect heart. It's the acceptance with a perfect heart that whatever God calls us to do, it's for our good because he's good. And we welcome pleasant things, but often we get angry with things that frustrate us or that we get denied with our losses and we get depressed for Abraham, there was only one reason for existence, and that was knowing and serving God. And he embodies what is said of and he embodies what it says in the Lord's Prayer. Your what come? Your kingdom come, your what? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Abraham's desire was to do the will of God. It's like Jesus says, Yeshua says, My meat and drink is to what? Do the will of the Father. He said, What gives me sustenance? What gives me strength? What gives me the koch, the strength to go forward, is doing the will of my Father and seeing the will of the kingdom done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is Abraham. <coughs> Faith that passes the test has great equanimity, mental calmness, composes, composure, even temper in difficult situations. It's a type of faith 
that is unmoved in the midst of the storms. And literally, this is Matthew 8, 24. Suddenly a furious storm came on the lake, so the waves swept over the boat, but Yeshua was sleeping. The disciples went and woke up saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. And he replied, you little faith, why are you so afraid? He got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. A storm came. The boat was a rockin'. The disciples who were fishermen, experienced on the sea, were terrified. And what was Yeshua doing? He was what? Sleeping. Sleeping. Just like Abraham slept, Messiah slept. He was unmoved by the storm that was going on around him. And when we are in him, there is an equanimity, there is a peace, there is a composure that we are able to maintain even in the most difficult times, even when everything else is raging around us, that we, because of our faith in him, can maintain our shalom can maintain our peace and not be moved. And a faith that pleases God doesn't just, is not, is quick to do the will of God, but it's also, but also is always looking up. And it says, and Abraham did what? He looked up from a distance and he saw the mountain. The question is, where are we placing our eyes? Abraham lived a life that was always looking up. He was constantly looking to the hand of heaven. He was constantly looking to the Lord. So many times, the thing that is keeping us from, from, from faith, from the promise, is we're busy looking down. We're like ostriches. We bury our head in the ground. We're looking at our problems. We're looking at everything around us. And God's like, look, just lift up your head. It says, Esa ain't el harin may I in Yavarizri. I lift my what? Eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. We're looking at our problems, our situations, and our circumstances. We're looking at our weaknesses and our frailties. And for every reason why it can't happen is going through our mind. And God is saying, just look up and look to me. And so many times, faith is about perspective. And when we have faith that looks up, we are elevated. When we have faith that looks to the, that can only look to the ground, we become grounded. We said this before. Are you, a, are you a chicken or are you an eagle? Right? Chickens are pecking in the ground. Eagles are soaring above everything, looking at the situations and circumstances. What are we looking at? Sometimes we're looking down. That's the problem. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes we're so busy looking back. Like when I was in, in, in look, one of the things I hate is when you're, when you're driving and all of a sudden, traffic comes to a standstill. And it happened to me the other day. I'm like, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Why is traffic so slow? Now, in California, that can always happen. But, you know, but I was like, unusual. And then I realized that there was an accident on the other side of the road. And everyone was stopping to look at the accident on the other side of the road. <laughs> call those looky-loos out here, right? Yeah. In Jersey, we call those rubberneckers. Rubbernecking, right? We got to stop rubbernecking. We're like looking at the accidents, we're looking around, God's like, no, look at me, look at what I'm doing, and we're busy looking back, but God, look what happened back there. Look where I've, look what happened to me in the, and God's like, no, just come on, look, don't be a looky-loo, there are no looky-loos in the kingdom. Stop looking back onto everything that went wrong and all your past hurt, okay, all those things are real, but that's not the focus. It's like God says to Israel, stop looking back to Egypt. And on what day does he look up? On the third day. He looks up on the third day, the day that's doubly blessed in creation, the day that God gives revelation at Mount Sinai, the day of resurrection, restoration, and renewal. So don't look back, look up, look forward. A faith that pleases God. A faith that pleases God passes the test, and part of the way it passes the test is that it never goes it alone. Never goes it alone. Isaac was not dumb. 
He knew what his father meant when he says to his father, Dad, uh, I, see the fi- I see the knife, I see the wood for the burnt offering, but where is the animal? And he's like, don't worry. God will provide. Well, I think Isaac had an idea that he might be that provision. Man, thank you. I'm the, it's like the chicken at the turkey at Thanksgiving, right? You know, and, and, and he had so much faith because even, you know, Isaac was not a teenage boy. Isaac was in his 30s at this age. His father's 90-something years old. Isaac could have easily overpowered his father, but he didn't. He allowed himself to be bound and placed upon the altar. And it says they left, and it says that, and they, they left there, the men that were with them, and it says the two walked to Achtav together. They walked together in agreement. We can't walk out our faith alone. We can't take the land alone. We can't fulfill our destinies for our lives alone. Two are better than one. We must walk together or else we will waver. God did not create us to be lone rangers. We are created for a community. We were created to be part of a team. It's like one stick is easily breakable, but you put many together and they cannot be broken. It's the strength of being bundled together. Faith that passes the test never tries to do it alone. We need each other. We need community. We need to walk it out together. Faith that passes the test and also pleases God is being willing to put everything on the altar because it trusts God to provide. Will you lay everything down? Will you trust him? Will you put your Isaac on the altar knowing that God has a ram in the bush? There's always something there. He always has. Might not be what we desire. It might not be what we expect. But there is a ram caught in the thicket. There is a provision. The rabbis say that one, why, did, why did it take so long for the ram to get to Abraham? Is because it said Hasatan, the evil one, tried to prevent the, the ram from getting to Abraham because he wanted to see the promise slaughtered on the altar. But God is faithful and he always brings the provision in the proper time. Do we trust God that he loves me more than I love myself? That he knows what's better for me than I know what's best for me? That God is good and faithful to his promises and God is in the business of bringing dead things back to life? I mean, that's the good news. It's like Hebrews, you know, it says Abraham, like he, 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 he did receive him back from the dead because he was as good as dead. And is there something that you need to trust God for in this season that you need to lay down that you need to put on the altar? Is there something that you need to trust God to raise up from the, from the dead? Trust him to give you back. And just as Abraham was willing to sacrifice everything and withheld nothing, we need to ask God not to withhold his passion, compassion towards us one of the reasons why we blow the shofar, the ram sword at Rosh Hashanah, is a remember of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac in his faith. And we ask God to remember us as he remembers the covenant and promises to Abraham. And it's so key because how many of you guys know that everything God does and the way God operates with us is always on the basis of covenant? That's a whole other story. We'll talk about that next time. But I want to look at some interesting things here, some of the similarities, because Isaac is a type of Messiah. And there's 30 ways that Isaac points to Yeshua, Jesus. Number one, the father leads his son to be sacrificed. Number two, a donkey is involved on the road to the sacrifice. They leave their homeland and go to a place of sacrifice. Abraham and Isaac leave where they're at, and Messiah leaves heaven to come to earth. To get from where they are to the place that they are going requires a journey. Each son is the only son, the beloved of the father, the son of promise. Both are the descendants of Abraham. Both sons were born with divine intervention. The sacrifice took place on the same mountain, on Mount Moriah. Abraham was sacrificed on the same mountain as Messiah. The companions that were with them stayed behind. 
Think about it for a moment. No one, none of the disciples went with Yeshua all the way, pretty much. They stayed behind, just like they did with Isaac and Abraham. The companions that were with them stayed behind. The son carried the own wood. Abraham, Isaac carried his own wood on his back, just like Isaac carried the cross. Jesus. I mean, Jesus carried the cross. The son asked questions of the father. The father knew what he was called to do. The son was submissive to the will of the father. The father was willing to sacrifice his son if necessary. The father believed in resurrection. The father loved the son. He, the, the third day, the Lord himself provided the sacrifice. The sacrifice was a substitute and a demonstration of God's love. Men of great faith were committed to obediently doing the will of God. Abraham was tested. Yeshua was tested. The son ultimately survived the sacrifice and was raised on the third day. So it's a picture, right? And faith that passes the test inevitably leads to promotion and blessing. By faith, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back again from the dead. And the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham, and Abraham looks up and he sees the lamb in the thicket, and he names that place Adonai Yireh, the Lord what? But the word can also mean see. The same word for see can mean to provide. Because seeing and providing go hand in hand. Because the substance of faith is sight. And it's with, with sight and seeing and faith is how we comprehend God's promises for us. And that is at the foundation of what it is that we're talking about here this morning. So are we willing to surrender everything to him? Are we willing to lay it all down for him? Are we willing to believe that this season that we're entering into is a season of life? Do we believe that God can cause the barren to conceive and to birth and bring forth something beautiful and I believe that faith is that key, as Scripture so tells us, without faith it is impossible to please God. So Abba, we just thank you this morning for what it is that you're doing in our lives. We ask God that you would prepare us for this season that is ahead. We're asking as we head towards a new year, we are asking that you would increase our faith that we would be willing to lay everything down. God, even as the ram was caught in the thicket, it was caught in the thorn bushes, so your son had a crown of thorn put on his head because he is the one who came to reverse the curse and to restore the blessing. And there is a blessing that comes when we have complete faith in you. And so we ask, Abba, that in this season that we would be willing to fix our eyes upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith.